The first question tonight is as follows. It has become standard practice to ask for a picture of a girl together with her Shidduch information. As a girl in Shidduchim for quite a few years, I feel like this is so inappropriate and I can't understand why so many people are okay with it. At the same time, people are telling me that even though it may not be the right thing to do, I should go along with it since these are the times that we are living in. However, I still feel Hashem wouldn't, so to speak, punish me for doing the right thing. Am I being too extreme by not sending a picture and explaining that this is not my derech? Okay, so this is a spectacular question from a very special young lady. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful question. And I, I, wanna, I wanna give it the, the serious treatment that it, it deserves. So I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start with the biggest picture and then slowly zoom in until we finally get to, uh, to her, her question. Just some background first. Human midos are arranged in a tree. Human character traits are arranged in a tree. And the tree has roots and branches. And at the top of the tree is the first and most primary choice anyone can make. And we make that choice every microsecond of our lives. Right now, at this moment, will I be a giver or a taker? Taking and giving are the two most fundamental mitos, the two most fundamental character traits, and we choose between those two character traits every moment, over and over and over again. If we choose taking, then we proceed down the left side of this Torah Midos tree to the next four most global bad Midos, bad character traits. That would be laziness, uh, using speech destructively to destroy relationships, haughtiness, and hedonism. Laziness, destructive speech, haughtiness, and hedonism. That's going to be the four general character traits that you hit on the left side once a person chooses taking. And if I choose giving, then I proceed down the right side of the tree to the next four fundamental good mitos, good character traits. And those would be alacrity, um, speech that builds relationships, humility, and giving pleasure to others. In other words, the left side and the right side are just mirror images of each other. And each of these four midos appear on each side. They're just opposites. Now, each of these sets of four good and bad midos, character traits, then split into dozens and then hundreds more good and bad character traits. But at the top of the tree, it all starts with one decision, which is giving or taking. And again, that's a decision that we make every single moment. And once we make that decision, we've chosen either the left side of the tree or the right side of the tree and limited what kind of character traits can be manifest inside of us. Okay, so with this in mind, understanding how primary this choice of giving and taking is, you now have to know that the ultimate crucible for making the most fundamental human choice between giving and taking is marriage. That is the arena in which we most refine our ability to choose giving and give it priority over taking. And that's why the greatest student of the Arizal, Rav Chaim Vital, said that most of my eternity is going to be determined by how I relate to my spouse. That is the single most influential decisions that I make in my life in terms of, of who I'm going to be for eternity is how I treat my spouse. Or another, another way of saying that is marriage is the ultimate arena for maximizing giving and minimizing taking, which is how we become like God. And that's how we establish what our olam haba, what our eternity is going to be.
Okay, that's introduction. Now, the next step. I recognize this is global, what I'm saying, but, and I will get back to this issue of pictures and shiduchim, but you have to see the bigger picture to really appreciate what's happening. Every tool in the universe can be used for its purpose or the opposite. If you've heard me speak, then you've heard me say this. Pens can be used to clarify or to obfuscate. Guns can be used to keep the peace or to make war. Marriage is intended to provide a playing field for giving. But someone could approach it as a taker and then leave this world a very selfish person. That's the nisayon. That's the test of marriage. Will we use this tool of marriage, this opportunity of marriage, for selfishness or for altruism? Okay. Step three. Selfishness is natural. Altruism is not. When babies come into this world, they say, feed me, keep me warm, cuddle me. And if you don't do all these things, I'll blast your ears out. That is completely natural. And if someone is going to become altruistic, they have to escape this natural program. They're going to have to veer off of their natural trajectory. Developing giving takes discipline. It takes hard work. It takes practice. Okay, now let's take a look at certain varieties, certain flavors of selfishness. It is perfectly natural for men to want a pretty woman. It is perfectly natural for women to want a man with the resources to protect and provide for her. These are natural, selfish drives. Now, the fact that they're selfish doesn't mean that they need to be entirely uprooted. Okay, so now tighten your seatbelt here. The Torah recognizes these drives and it allows for them as long as the person doesn't allow satisfying these, these selfish desires to convert his or her whole approach in marriage to selfishness. Meaning you can take into account a natural need when you're approaching marriage. You can take that into account. You just have to make sure that your role in the marriage is as a giver. But that doesn't mean that you have to ignore all of your natural needs. And I'm going to show this to you in Jewish law. For example, the Torah requires a man to accept the obligations of the Jewish marriage contract, the Ksuva. And in the Ksuva, the man promises I promise to work and to support for you. I promise to provide for you, he says to his wife. Every Jewish man is required to take upon himself these obligations of ksuva when he gets married. If he doesn't take these obligations upon himself, he's not allowed to live with his wife. And if you open up the Code of Jewish Law, in the section called Evan Ezer, section 69, it specifies minimally he's got to buy his wife food and clothing, he's got to cover her medical care, he's got to redeem her if she's held for ransom, he's got to pay for her funeral, funeral costs, etc., etc. There's a whole bunch, a long list of financial obligations a man takes on, which is what a wife would want. A wife would want a guarantee that her husband is going to provide for her. That's a natural desire that a woman has. And the Torah says she doesn't have to uproot that. The Torah says, you know what? We will take that natural need into account and we will insist that he provide for her. It, it turns out that for a man, a wife is a very expensive step in life. And the Torah intended that. Not just because it's good for a man to give to his wife in these ways, but because the Torah recognizes and accepts a woman's need, her natural need for her husband to provide for her financially. Okay. So, in the same way that the Torah recognizes a woman's need 
to be taken care of financially. The Torah recognizes a man's need for a beautiful wife. And the Gemara in Tractate Kedushin, the Talmud in Tractate Kedushin, this is page 41a, explicitly rules. This is in the name of Rabbi, of Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yehuda Amar Rav says, I'm going to use the Hebrew for a moment, then I'll translate. Asur la'adam she'kadesh et ha'isha ad shir ena. It is halachically prohibited. Jewish law forbids a man to become engaged to a woman until he has actually seen her. I, he's spoken on the phone with her. He, he has written back and forth with her. He knows her values. He's seen her biography, right? He actually has to see her. Why? The Talmud continues. Shema Yirabad Davar Maguna. Maybe when he sees her, there'll be something about her which is very unattractive. Vitisgana Elav. And she will be not pretty in his eyes. She'll, she, she'll be repulsive in his eyes. And then the Gemara goes one more step, the Talmud goes one more step, which is mind-boggling. Rahmana Amar, and the Torah says, kamocha, you should love your neighbors yourself. Okay, that's a very, very strange ending. So I'm going to come back to that ending in a moment. What does loving your neighbors yourself have to do with this? A man needs to see that he has a pretty wife. And if she's not pretty, he can't marry her. So why does the Torah, why does the Talmud conclude, why is this required? Because you should love your neighbors yourself. What does that have to do with this? So what seems to be going on here is this. There seem to be dual considerations. It's not just the Torah accepts that a man wants a pretty wife and needs a pretty wife. The, the Torah gives a reason. You must love your neighbors yourself. If the Torah only permitted a man to use beauty as a criterion for picking his wife, then that would be God accepting a basic male need. But the Torah doesn't just permit him to use beauty as a criterion. The Torah actually forbids a man to marry a woman he isn't attracted to. And then it says, what's the reason? Because he must be as merciful to and concerned about the feelings of his wife as he would want someone to be merciful to and concerned about himself. So it turns out that this law, which gives the man the right, not only the right, but insists that he marry a woman that he finds beautiful, that, that law is also to protect her. That is, every woman has a need to be beautiful in her husband's eyes. No woman wants to feel she's unattractive. And the Torah insists that this need be taken into account as well. So, the man is not allowed to marry a woman without seeing her because if he marries her and then sees her for the first time and she's not pretty to him, it will cause her agony. And how could you cause somebody else agony? You wouldn't want somebody to cause you agony. Okay, so now, with this in mind, that the Torah recognizes a man needs to have a pretty wife, and the Torah recognizes that a woman needs to have a man who can provide for her. Or another way of saying that, as it's said in modern society often, is that women have a dominant interest in financial stability on their husband's part, and men have a dominant interest in physical beauty on their wife's part. And physical beauty and finance are sort of the two flip sides of this coin, depending on whether you're approaching it as a male or a female. Now, when I say dominant, I don't mean that this is the primary criterion or the primary, pri pri primary criteria that somebody should use when picking a, a, a spouse. But it is basic and it is required. And without this, you can't move forward. A, a woman cannot marry a man who can't fulfill ksuva. 
and a man can't marry a woman that he's not attracted to. So looks and finance definitely are real human needs and the Torah takes them into account. Okay, now, with this theoretical framework, let's turn to your very beautiful question. When a shadchan, or the family, or a young man, asks for a picture of the girl before he dates her, that is somewhat like a woman asking in advance for a certain level of financial commitment from her husband. Okay, now, can you imagine today a woman saying that, I won't marry anyone who can't provide me with at least $20,000 a month in spending money starting 10 years after we're married and a five-bedroom home in any of the following upscale communities. Okay, that would be viewed as very superficial. How offensive. So, the young lady who's asking this question reasonably asks herself, the person who's requiring a picture in advance, is he looking for a partner or a piece of meat? Just as a man would ask whether she's looking for a partner or a bank account. And I'll take it a step deeper. The more sophisticated a person is, the more their perception of someone's beauty changes after actually meeting them and getting to know them. If a person is base and they're animalistic, then measurements and symmetry might be all that matters. But as people become more human, as they become more sensitive, then personality starts to mingle with the physical appearance inextricably. Someone with objectively ordinary looks could be outrageously attractive when you meet them in person the vivaciousness and the bubbly personality and the humor and the coyness and all sorts of other factors can completely change the picture for a really sophisticated man. So, although the, the Torah says a man needs to be attracted to his wife, really of what value is a photograph? Because you can't tell if you're going to be attracted to her based on a photograph. I mean, if, if you're a polar bear, then you could tell based on a, on, on a photograph. If, if you're a, 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 a vulture, then you could tell based on a photograph. But if you're a sophisticated human being, there needs to be personality. There needs to be interaction. You have to, you have to actually like see what is this person like. And I've seen it over and over again with people that I've helped with Shidduchim, that the way the person looks at the first meeting is, for a sophisticated individual, never the way that they look three or four meetings down the line. The physical appearance changes. They'll tell you. I remember when I met them, they weren't so attractive, but they're so attractive now. I'm so into their looks now. Now, their looks didn't change. It's not like the, 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 the woman started dressing differently or changed her makeup. It's all the same. But as you get to know her and her personality flows out through her pores, then her whole, her whole appearance changes, and that can be for, for, for good or for bad. It could be that somebody who has, you know, the perfect cosmopolitan face, uh, and, you know, they could be a cover girl, but the personality is so flat that when you meet them, they look ugly. Uh, even though in, in the picture, they're amazing, and it could also be the opposite, that someone who looks very ordinary could be absolutely mind-bogglingly gorgeous after they open their mouth and start to talk and interact with you. And I'll take it a step further. Let's, let's approach this with some degree of intelligence. You don't need Photoshop anymore to change a photograph. Every smartphone has software for doing this. So really, I mean, photos are meaningless. They are really meaningless. Uh, a, a, a photo is probably a lie. And someone who doesn't look amazing in a photo today just didn't want to edit it 
in their in their smartphone software or they don't have access to a smartphone to do it or they didn't have a friend who had Photoshop, but you could never know what somebody actually looks like based on a photograph today. It's just a dumb way to try to evaluate whether you will be attracted. You cannot tell that way. So now to answer your question, if, if we want to judge the person or the people asking for this photograph favorably, we could say that they're just concerned about trying to fulfill the Talmudic law that you have to see a woman and feel attracted to her before marrying her. But if that's the case, if it's really just a concern that I, I the Haftarech Kamocha, I just want to fulfill my obligation to be attracted before I marry somebody. If that's the case, why doesn't he wait to meet her on the first date and see if he's attracted? Is he so superficial that however she looks in the photo, that's how she's going to look after he's met her and spoken to her for three hours? I, I, I suppose I'm trying to be down the chafzchus. I'm trying to give some justification for, for this request. Maybe you could argue that there's so many eligible women available today for every man that he's got to use some criteria to filter and focus his dating. He can't date every woman so looking at photos is a reasonable way to make the cut. But again, it's foolish since it ignores personality and it ignores the possibility of Photoshop being used. So it's, even if the goal were to fulfill the halacha, requesting a photo is just a dumb way to do it. So the bottom line is that you're right. There is something foolish, there's something superficial, there's something denigrating about a man asking to see a photo before agreeing to go out. It's, pardon my language, it's dumb and it's in poor taste. And men shouldn't do it. And it's not just poor taste. It could be a sign that a man is a taker. And now we're coming full circle. It could be what he's looking for is what he can get out of the deal. And in this way, it could be he's like that soldier described in the Torah in Parshish Kitisa, who, who in Parshish Kitetse, that grabs a pretty woman in battle because he wants to marry her, because he wants to marry a pretty girl. She's not, even, she's not even Jewish, but he just sees a pretty body and he wants it. And his selfishness leads him eventually to hate her and ultimately, if they marry, the home is so dark and selfish that the child comes out a criminal of Ben Soromora, and it's a disaster. So it could be we're dealing with a person who's just selfish. And, and you know, just like there could be a woman who, she doesn't want a husband, she just wants a bank account. So, so too, there could be a man who doesn't want a wife. He just wants a, a pretty girl. That could be. Okay, now very, very practically. And I'm speaking to you now like I would speak to my daughter. You want to know if you should cooperate. So if you were my daughter, I would not tell you to go along with it. I would remind you that it might not be the young man who's asking. It could be a corrupt Shadchan or a parent with funny values, or a Rosh Hashiva with funny values. There are so many people who are giving their two cents about who he should date and why, that it, it might not be him, it might be somebody else who's giving the input and requiring these photographs. So therefore, I would tell you, sweetie, if you want to date him, if everything else sounds good, then it is okay to send a picture. It's okay. And if you don't want to become involved in a situation like that, I would also tell you it's okay to move on and not submit the picture. That's 100% fine. Okay. Now here's what you've got to keep in mind, and this is my final concern here. 
there are communities where this practice has become so accepted that it could be hard to get a date there without going along with it. You might have to submit a photo in those communities to get a date. I do not believe that that is all Orthodox communities in the world. I know that's not the case. In fact, I would tell you that it's much more common on the coasts than it is in the middle of the United States, and it's much more common in the United States than it is in Israel, and it's a cultural thing. So, if that's the case, if the world that you live in, the, the culture that you're participating in, accepts that everybody has to submit photos, then normal hishtadlis, the reasonable effort that needs to be made to get married, either means submitting a photo or dating in a different community that doesn't expect photos. You might have to get up and go someplace else if you don't want to submit photos. That's a possibility. And I, 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 I won't tell you, that even though it's dumb to request the photo, and it's, it, it, it shows degradation, but if, if, you, if you want to pay that price in order to participate in Shidduchim in your community, it is permitted. It's not forbidden to do such a thing. And if you don't want to pay that price, recognize that might mean you can't date in that community because this dumb custom has become accepted. Okay, that's my overview. Any, any questions? I recognize maybe what I said is a drop controversial because it's so widely accepted in some places. But if you have questions, I'm very happy to take questions. I hope you enjoyed this answer from Rabbi Kellerman's Inner Circle program, where he gets on the phone every month and answers questions just like this. In, in addition to the Q&A, there are uh, new courses that Rabbi Kellerman is teaching. I invite you to check them all out at lawrencekellerman.com. And if you have any questions, just email us at info at lawrencekellerman.com.